I thought I would just simply ask, uh, would like to ask, uh, would like to talk about the importance of this work for our world today, and to end by giving you younger theologians a cautionary note, but also an exhortatory note. If there is one phrase that captures the mindset that is dominant in our techno-scientific culture, I, I once was a medical doctor, I practiced medicine, um, and if, uh, if there's one thing that was always said, it was, don't just stand there, do something. And that is the criticism that engineers and scientists and medical doctors, uh, that's the critique or the criticism they make of philosophers and theologians alike. You're just standing there. Our pragmatic culture is pragmatic for practicality's sake. And in being so practical, we find that the problems addressed by our pragmatic culture are solved, though only momentarily. Then we have to solve the problems created by our pragmatic, our pragmatic attempts to solve the original problems to begin with. Case in point, we create our technologies, we do something to solve our problems, or to fulfill our every wish. And the unintended consequences of our technological pragmatism is the ecological crisis, which we now think technology will solve for us as well. Yet for those of us who would offer therapies, like this new Trinitarian Ontology Symposium here today and the NTO conference back in September, I want to give us a cautionary note to attend to the failed ontology of our time in order to get the diagnosis right and to attend to the pragmatics of healing. For healing does not come in our thinking about God, but in the everydayness of our practicing to encounter our Trinitarian God. For those of you who do not know me, I once practiced medicine. I am best known in the world of medicine, science, technology, and religion. I do religion and science, if you will, but in a very different way than most people do it. In my work, I mostly ask the question, what would we have to believe about the fundamental nature of reality in order for us to think that this scientific idea is legitimate? Or what would we have to believe about the fundamental nature of reality in order to believe that, the, that technological or medical intervention is legitimate. In other words, I ask questions about the fundamental ontologies that are enacted in our practical endeavors, whether medical, scientific, technical, or even cultural. And then I point out that Christians cannot play out those practical ontologies by virtue of our participation in the divine life of the Trinity. I am fond of saying to my undergraduate students, most of whom resist thinking philosophically, that they are philosophers because they enact ontological thinking every day, every day of their lives, in all that they do, for the sake of being practical. If they wake up in the morning and get out of bed, they have fundamental beliefs about the nature of reality, however unexamined they might be. They believe that it is better to get out of bed than to stay in bed, because they have to go to class. They want to go to class, or they have to go to class because they want to learn. They want to learn so that they can be very, get very good jobs, which usually means being very efficacious in their jobs in business or in engineering. They want to be efficacious because they want to have high-paying jobs. They want to have high-paying jobs because they want to eat and to have nice things. They want to eat because they want healthy bodies. They want healthy bodies because they want to live. They want to live because, well, it's better than not living. The questions tend to stop there because if I am thinking about what is truly good, I may not make it to class on time and therefore will not get the high paying jobs. Something like life is, something about life is good. Something about life moves us towards things that are ends and goods in themselves, but pausing to reflect on the goods, to listen for the silences, disrupts the pragmatics of our doing. The work that we do as philosophers and theologians, then, is problematic to the pragmatics of our culture. It is much the same way in medicine. I'm fond of telling my medical students that it is my opinion that systematic philosophy was born out of medicine. Someone had a growth on his body, and they began to wonder, what is that? The person went to a healer whom the patient thought would, be, would know something about it, would know something. The healer would claim to have knowledge, therefore there's an epistemology at work. 
about what the growth is, an ontology. But the whole enterprise was framed by the moral or ethical. Is the growth bad for me? And as Heidegger has pointed out, as long as things are working, the reality of things get lost in their everydayness. And that's where we mostly live our lives. But if we look around right now, we notice that things are not working. Modern techno-science, with its quest to fulfill our most frivolous desires, our political institutions that promise unfettered wish fulfillment, our economic structures that create the mechanisms by which we fulfill those desires, have taken an, our entire world and pushed it to the brink of collapse. Even the parts of the world that do not participate in our techno-scientific political economy are suffering under this techno-scientific political economy. Things fall apart, pushing us now to ask the question, what is that thing? What is it that we are doing? Why did all our nice things break? Why, were they even nice things to begin with? We should say to the pragmatics of our technological political culture then, not, don't just stand there, do something. Don't just do something, stand there. As a physician, it is always better to have a firm diagnosis so you know what to do to help the patient. A firm diagnosis requires us to turn to ontology. And so my work turns to diagnosing the problem, the problem of our culture, such that the right therapies can be deployed. What is that thing? What is the fundamental nature of reality such that all our techno-scientific, political, economic therapies have failed us? And in fact, all the therapies offered by techno-scientific political economy are killing us. And it is bad enough that things fall apart. It is worse when our fundamental beliefs enacted in our practices ends up, in fact, breaking those things. So what is the source of our problems today? Whereas the contemporary sciences were born in the age that was anti-metaphysical, that did not prevent them from operating with a naive and unexamined ontology an everyday ontology. One of my PhD students wrote her thesis on this question, why did liberal Protestants embrace eugenics? Her answer was they lacked a metaphysics and uncritically embraced the implicit metaphysics of the geneticists. The medical and technological sciences do in fact have a metaphysics, which is to say they have a practical ontology. Can we afford not to do metaphysics if we are to intervene in what ails our patient? That is our culture. In contemporary medical science, oh, I'll just skip this part. It's boring. <laughs> so why am I telling you all of these things that seemingly have little to do with Trinitarian ontology? Why am I talking about ontology as it manifests itself in science, medical, and technological thinking? Or, in short, in our popular culture? The answer is because all ontologies are practical at some level. They are enacted by us as we take up with these realities. The ancient farmer might have been wrong about the beings that moved in the universe, thinking the sun traveled around the earth, but he was still able to plant, nurture, and grow his weed. He did not have genetic ontologies or understandings of genes in order to understand the complexity of inheritance patterns, yet he was able to breed different animals to suit different purposes. Our practical ontologies work, or rather, they work up until a point. They can cease to work for a number of reasons, like the lack of technical uh, skills or a lack of know-how, or they can cease to work because, at some level, they are flat wrong about the fundamental nature of reality. The way things actually exist may seem to the, the way things actually exist seem to resist the way that we have imagined them to exist in our culture. A bonsai artist can trim the tree only as far as the tree permits it to trim, to be, it permits itself to be trimmed. If he goes too far, not respecting the ontological limits of the tree, then the tree will die. The tree has its own integrity. It has its own ontological limits. It will only conform to the will of the, or, the artist up until a point. Our practical ontologies, which are vivified in our modern techno-scientific political economy, then are really just figments of our imagination. Yet these techno-scientific political ontologies do some work. They are supported by our political by the political economy. 
They are supported by our political economy and are deployed onto a reality that resists our thinking and our doing, and it simply breaks sometimes under the strains of deploying that game. So what we've been witnessing in recent years are the limits of our practical ontologies. Our political ontologies do not conform to the actualities of life together in a culture. Our medical ontologies do not conform to the actual realities of human bodies or human psyches. Our technological ontologies do not conform to the actual realities of things we hope to manipulate or to, re uh, or to realistically re realistic possibilities of what we hope to bring into being through our manipulation of what we think is already there. In my own work, I've argued, and in a way I continue to argue, that these political, medical, technological, and cultural ontologies all share a fundamental ontological commitment. The ontology that animates all our practical work in contemporary, late modern, western, and so-called democratic cultures is a power ontology. At, at, uh, at, heart, at the heart of our way of life, there's a fundamental belief that the only thing that truly exists is power. Even the subatomic particles are power relations. Energy is convertible into matter. Materials into convertible, are convertible into energy. There is no substance per se, only power. Subatomic particles combine through the mediation of power to create atoms. Atoms fuse through the mediation of power to create larger atoms. These larger atoms fuse with other atoms through the mediation of lesser powers to create molecules. Molecules coalesce into macromolecules and then into cells and tissues and organs. And the organisms and then the herds or the tribes of those organisms all working together to secure the sun's power which has been stored in carbon bonds like plants which we eat. But we have to secure our food and we have to do so by binding together as hunting and gathering tribes. Politics is about power relations in order to secure power or, in the case of the United States, in order to have a war-making culture to secure what? Oil. Power. We have to use power to beat back those who would steal the carbon bombs that we would have for our food, or our oil, our power, which is nothing more than the power stored in the carbon bombs created over millions of years of the sun's power. It is all power, all the way up, all the way down, power upon power, power, that's all there is, and there isn't any more. We must say to our techno-scientific political economy, don't just do something, stand there. Wait. Hearken to the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And all of you are the ones crying in the wilderness, as theologians. Today, we've embarked on trying to offer alternative ontologies, new Trinitarian ontologies to our alien culture by close examination of different participatory ontologies at the heart of the Christian tradition. You have explored participation in divine being and divine knowing. You have explored various historical reflections on the working of the Trinity from the well-known from well-known figures as Augustine and Thomas Aquinas or less well-known figures like Achar of St. Victor. And to figures who are recent, like Lukakov and Babakov. You have asked about language and linguistics and silence and music, of kenosis and poesis, of poetics both as a human act and as a divine act of creation. You have explored the relationships of the persons in the Trinity, its creative activity. You have explored the event, the incarnation and politics. You have explored unity and plurality, repetition, and reflection and identity. <coughs> and you have pointed to art and repetition as foundational to our doing and our knowing. And you've explored the analogical nature of reality itself, asked how we and our cultures can be more cognizant of our participation in the divine life of the life in Trinity. You have asked us to think on contingency and finitude, the otherness of our neighbor and the otherness of our own being in relation to the Trinity, you have explored the ways that we can move from activity and busyness to sitting still and standing there in silence so that we might have a just memory, just remembering, a just remembering of our own stories and the stories of all those others. You have asked about a just memory, about practices of remembering and our own stories in light and remembering the stories of others 
in light of the unfolding justice flowing from the immortal trinity. Yet, we would do well to attend to one cautionary note. While we were telling our culture, don't just do something, stand there, we must exa ask, what exactly are we as theologians and philosophers doing in standing there? If we are to believe my colleagues in engineering and science and medicine, philosophers and theologians are really good at just standing there, doing nothing. And so we, as theologians and philosophers, must ask, what is the kind of doing that is necessary to heal the realities of our broken world? What is it that we are doing? First, our practices are about experiencing the God that comes alongside God's creation. We repeat the prayers of the church. We keep the church's fasts and not just its peace. After all, as theologians and philosophers, we must be careful ourselves, for we have two ways that we can fail. First, to be sure, we must remember that in attending to the Trinity, we are not to act like engineers. The Trinity should not be understood as a blueprint for building the building of a society, for we are very likely to build new idols ourselves. Second, we must not just sit by in contemplative silence and repeating our prayers, for that too could fail. Certainly we, certainly, we pause to remember the mystery of divine being, but that does not mean that we just stand there. The Trinity is active in creating and redeeming. It is active in revealing itself beyond the limits of our thinking. So we must act in our thinking and in our rethinking. We must participate in creating and redeeming the world ourselves. We are not called to mere contemplation, to mere sitting there, standing there in silence. For in, for in the very act of writing our papers, or our music, or our poetries, or even our theologies, we are acting out practical ontologies. So insofar as we are thinking and writing, we are not, in fact, avoiding metaphysics. We are just deploying another metaphysics. Just as the scientists thought they had no metaphysics, they enacted another one. And yet, every essay that we write in theology, which we must write, which we must do, risks being an act of idolatry. Moreover, if you are going to stop the bleeding of our culture, we must act on the realities of decay that we ourselves have brought into existence with our techno-scientific political economy. We must, act, we must enact practical ontologies and understand that every act of our doing has its limitations. Every metaphysical proposition risks idolatry, but passivity also risks idolatry or worse, nihilism. So, what must we say to our techno-scientific political economic culture is this. Don't just do something. Just stand there for a moment. Stop deploying the techno-scientific gaze of our political economy. And what is most needful to be heard by us as theologians and philosophers is this. Don't just stand there. Do something. Certainly, we must stand before the existing one, offering our act of worship. But the Trinity that we worship is active in coming alongside us in the Incarnation and in the Most Holy Sacrament. Surely, we must pray. We must give voice and sound to the Trinity through our prayers and through our doing of philosophy and theology. But we must come alongside creation to attempt to stop the bleeding that we have caused. If what we believe about God, the Holy Trinity, is true, then there are probably an infinite number of correct ways that we can take up with the suffering of creation and different, in an infinite number of correct ways to narrate all that is happening. That does not mean that we, there aren't wrong ways. It just means that there are possibly an infinite number of correct ways that we can take up with and come alongside creation to stop and to help redeem the bleeding that we have caused. So what does it mean for a theologian and philosopher to come alongside a bleeding world? It probably calls us to be creative like God who in creating withdrawals only to respond by feel, filling the void in the redemptive act of Christ and his self-giving kenosis of the cross. Christ steps into the void, into the breach, and thus we as worshipers of the Trinity must also step into the breach. 
And how does one step into such a breach, into such a void? Carefully, with fear and trembling. But we must into that, step into that uh, void. For that is what it means to finitely repeat the creative and redemptive act of the holy, divine, mortal, and life-giving trinity. So, I guess, my exhortation to you as young theologians and philosophers is to always consider your work. How it is that your work steps into the void. Your thinking is a kind of doing. But always ask yourself, in what way is your thinking a kind of doing? How is our thinking a stepping into the void, or into the breach, and how might that heal our broken world? When doing your work, I think we should always consider, how do we step into the void of the bleeding that we have caused? After all, even theologians and philosophers are called to repeat, though not identically, the kenosis of Christ by stepping into the breach. Now we can go to the pub. <laughs> <laughs>